Okay, another viewer question. Uh, today we're going to be talking about the subject of repentance. Okay, now I have um, preached about this for a long time, quite a few years now, and uh, I've caught a lot of flack because of, of the stands that I take for the biblical meaning of repentance. And uh, we're going to be going over what, you know, because I've talked about this in other studies, but this, you know, email that I got here, excuse me, is saying, you know, narrow it down. What does repentance mean in the Bible? Well, um, I will tell you right here at the beginning, there are multiple meanings of the word repentance. You say, well, then how do we tell which one is the right one? What's the context? It's not about one being right and one being wrong. It's simply saying, what is the context of this thing? All right. Let me read you the email here. And of course, you know, I'm going to uh, save the name. I'm not going to show this on screen or anything. But the subject is, can you please clarify for us the true meaning of repentance? Okay, it says here, Dear Brian, my husband and I need clarification on the true and complete meaning of repentance. I have listened twice to your sermon, Rep Repentance and the True Gospel, and I can see that you explain repentance as a change of mind only. I am saved only for the last three years, my husband for ten years or more, and yet we struggle with this basic stone teaching of the true gospel. The more we understand it, the better we can explain to the lost and not teach them heresy. I can see few teachers say the same thing, repentance is a change of mind, period. But when I look back at how I felt when I repented, I don't see it only as a change of mind and direction. It is more than that. Here is how I felt, and please correct us and teach us the truth, as we can't find a complete teaching of the repentance and gospel. Okay, before I go on there, let me just say that, you know, I try as hard as I can to try and keep the gospel as a very, very simple thing. And, you know, the gospel is that Jesus Christ died for your sins, buried, rose again. You know, if he just died for your sins, it wouldn't mean anything. He has to be buried, and it, you know, like everybody else. But then the thing that separates Jesus from other saviors, other leaders out there, religious leaders, is Jesus rose from the dead. See, that's where what we believe is different. Muhammad didn't rise from the dead. All the popes are dead, you know, worm food in the ground, <laughs> fertilizer. You know, um, Buddha didn't rise from the dead. All of these guys, they, they didn't rise from the dead. Jesus Christ did. That's what separates us. But then, okay, why did he do that? Why was Jesus, why did he die on the cross? Why was he buried? Why did he rise again the third day? What was the point of that? Well, you say, so that we could get saved. Okay, saved from what? Well, an eternity in hell. Why would you go to hell? What's the purpose? Why are you going to hell? Is it just everybody goes to hell, you know, like it or not or whatever? What puts you in hell? Sin. That's why Jesus died on the cross, because we aren't able to work our way into heaven. Okay? Your good works can never get you to heaven. So what is it that condemns you? What is it that keeps you out of heaven? You say lack of good works. Well, lack of good works, but it's your sin that condemns you. If you die before you have a knowledge of sin, under that age of accountability, a little child or something that can't understand that they're sinning against God, you die under that age, sin's not imputed to you. Okay, God does not charge you with sinning. But you read later on, when you get older, the wages of sin is death. Okay, so now understanding I'm a sinner... I can't save myself. My good works will never save me. Jesus died on that cross. Okay? Now, how does repentance come into this whole thing? Well, repentance falls in there with, I understand I'm a sinner. And understanding that you're a sinner, saying, I'm going to get saved, why would you continue in the same things that you're doing that have you in that part, in that to that point of being convicted now? And see, this is where the whole thing comes in, this heresy of easy believism, because they try to divorce that from the gospel. They try to say, you shouldn't be convicted of sin. You shouldn't say, I'm going to have a changed life after salvation. Things are going to have to change. I don't even understand what all it's going to be yet, but I know if I come to God and I get saved, He is going to tell me what to do at that point in time, and He is going to convict me of sin, and He is going to make my life change. 
See, it's not about you get saved and then you do all these things to merit your salvation. That's work salvation. I have never taught that. I have never once taught that. And people put that thing on me. Oh, you're teaching work salvation. I am not teaching work salvation. God, through His Holy Spirit, when you get saved, He comes upon you and your views and, and things of sin will change. Then you live a sinless life. I didn't teach that either. Okay, again, that gets, that gets put on me or something. You know, no, you don't just all of a sudden become sinlessly perfect in terms of your regular life and things. You know, of course, the righteousness of Jesus Christ is imputed to you. So in eternal record, okay, yes, you are. Your sins have been paid for by the blood of Jesus Christ. All sins, past, present, future, are washed away. But if you live in sin, if you mess around with sin, now you, your, the judgment is different. Okay, before when you're lost and you are living in sin, well, you're on your way to hell. You're condemned to hell. You know, you're headed there. But when you become saved, now you are a son of God, daughter of God, too, if you're a, a woman there, but it just falls under the heading of son of God in most verses. And you, you're a son of God, and now you're judged as one of his children. See? So... That's the whole deal here. But the whole issue is this thing of repentance. And the reason repentance, the way I preach it, the reason it is so much spoken against is because you have false teachers out there that have never had their pride broken. They have never looked at themselves as being worthy of death and hell. They have never come to the point of saying, you know what, I'm just broken. I, I can't do anything to save myself. God have mercy on me, I'm just a wicked old sinner. You know? And their life really doesn't change much. They take on some kind of external regulations or, or uh, some kind of religious practices or something like that. But you look and it's just, you don't really see that changed life that comes from true conversion. But we're going to look about that in the study. But back to the email here, it says, First of all, I realized, what have I done? which means feel sorry for the sins I have been doing and the direction I was going away from God. Secondly, I changed my view of God. If before was not thinking much of Him and His power of salvation, now I realized He is the only one who can save me as all my trials failed. So I turned to God. Thirdly, I stopped at that moment from the sin I was doing, sin which made me realize what have I done, so it is a stop there from sin, but we know that we cannot stop sinning only for a day or a week, but then we won't be able. We have the proof of all our life of trials being good and stopping sin. Okay, therefore comes to part three. I'm going to talk about part three here, or part four, excuse me, and now I'm going to talk about part three in a minute. Four, we ask God to save us and help us to stop sinning, as by our own power we can't. This is how I felt, uh, how it happened to me. Forgot to shut the chime off again. Um, <clears throat> okay, the third one there. Stopping sinning. All right, at the moment of your salvation. Understanding that. Understanding I have to have a changed life here. Now, see, a lot of people say, well, that's Lordship Salvation. Well, Lordship Salvation would say that you have to repent of, you have to stop sinning every single sin. You have to just come and confess everything and stop sinning totally or you didn't really get saved. And that is a heresy, definitely. But when you come to a point of understanding that you are a sinner, okay, I'll give you a good case in point here. Um, Jeffrey Dahmer. If you don't know the story of Jeffrey Dahmer, he was a young man, and he was raised in churches. Okay, he went to church growing up. And in his teens, while he was in high school, he had a um, young man come and they were just kind of hanging out or whatever because his parents were divorcing and they were like, they let him at home the one time by himself for like a couple days or something. And he had a young man come and, uh, and they were just kind of hanging out or whatever. And the young man said, well, I got to go. And Jeffrey Dahmer killed him, murdered him. And then after high school, it got worse and worse and worse to the point where Jeffrey Dahmer was... Uh, involved in sodomite relationships. You know, he was in sodomy. 
and it went from there to cannibalism. And Jeff Dahmer was cutting his victims up and eating parts of their bodies and, and putting parts of their bodies, preserving parts of the bodies and all this other stuff. Just totally disgusting. Terrible, terrible, horrible things. And he went to prison for it. He finally got caught and went to jail for this thing. And in jail, one of the victim's sisters came in to see Jeff Dahmer and she said, you need to find God and God will forgive you for the sins that you've committed. And so Jeff Dahmer, right then and there, believed in Jesus Christ and went back and, and ate more people, right? No, no, no. You see, Jeff Dahmer is the extreme case. Most people don't do that level of sin. They, they just, you know, well, I've only lied and steal and cheated and things like this. I'm not killing people and eating people. But the point is, he was living a terrible life of sin. And he, it didn't take much for him to be found guilty of being a sinner before God. Okay, not going to have to take much, you know, to make him feel convicted for his life of sin, you know, there. And so he was broken at that point in time and said, God would save a wretched, filthy person like me and give me a clean heart and, and, and you know, a new life? Yeah. And he got saved. I mean, he really got saved. I read stuff about him. You know, he was talking to people about the Bible version issue, talking about creation science. It was on national television. He testified for Jesus Christ right on national television. Stone Phillips, uh, I don't know if it was NBC or whoever, you know, there, but Stone Phillips is a guy. He's like interviewing him and things, and, and, um, and he's like, you know, I put my faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. You know, changed life. And actually the prisoners that were in jail with him after his conversion, they beat him to death, killed him. And you know why? I can guarantee it was because he was witnessing to them. Yeah, changed life. See, but how would it have been if Jeff Dahmer would have continued in that sin? See, when you come to a place where you understand, I'm a sinner, and my sins have separated me and God. I'm now, a, I'm now guilty. I'm condemned before God. You're not saying, well, I'm just going to clean up all my sins so I can merit salvation. That would be works. You're saying, God, I'm sick and tired of this sin. I know it's wrong. I've been trying for years to fight this thing. Please, God, help me. You know, I'll tell you another one. If you've not heard some of my testimony before, I need to put the whole thing together. I used to have it on you know, recording, but, you know, I, I need to redo it. But most of my lost life, I was addicted to pornography. And I tried to fight the thing, and I tried to, and again, I was raised in church buildings and all this stuff, and I tried to fight it and tried to fight it and tried to fight it. I could not get victory over it until I came to God broken and said, God, have mercy on me, a sinner. I was scared when I was 25. I had prayed this little prayer of salvation when I was eight years old in Sunday school. It didn't help me. Okay, I went to a public school, and I got involved in all kinds of things, got into the in crowd and stuff like that, you know, and... I couldn't fight sin. I wanted to, but I couldn't fight it until after I got saved. And then when I got saved, you say, oh, then you never looked at it again after that. No, it was still a little bit of a struggle for a little while. Okay? It still went for a little while, and I struggled and struggled and struggled, and finally the Lord helped me, you know, give me victory over that thing. It's an addiction, okay? And I understand there are addictions out there. I've had some of you viewers talk about addictions to cigarettes, addictions to alcohol, and things like that. And I do know some of you struggle with pornography as well. You know, the point is, if you are saved, if you are genuinely saved, God can eventually lead you out of that sin. You say, well, then you're now you're sinlessly perfect. Yeah, right, you ought to know better after watching my videos. I mean, come on, <laughs> you know, I'm not sinlessly perfect. But the point is, my, as, as I live longer here on the earth, you know, I get more and more away from that, those sins of the flesh and the lusts of the flesh and things like that. There's a change. You know, that's the way it's supposed to be. And that's what, you know, the sister is writing here. There's supposed to be a change that happens. Back to the article here. Um, 
She says here, Now we myself are confused, as I used to listen to lots of Jack Hiles' teachings and David J. Stewart, and both mention that you don't have to feel sorry for sins and you can't stop sinning. Again, you know, that's a misconception there. You know, you don't have to feel sorry for sins and you can't stop sinning. Well, wait a second. Yes, you do have to feel sorry for sins. God be merciful to me to a sinner. You know, the Bible talks about that, feeling sorry for your sins, you know, and you can't stop sinning. Well, that's true. That's true. You can't stop sinning. You're, you're always going to be tempted to sin, okay? And if you can break down every little thing about sin and, and your impure thoughts and lying and, and pride, you know, gluttony, hello, Thanksgiving, you know. <laughs> I mean, most people practice a little bit of gluttony at Thanksgiving, See, so you can, you can pick out all those little sins and stuff and you can say, see, you can't stop sinning. So why would you have to repent of sin to be saved? See, the little mind games that Jack Hiles and, and this David Stewart guy, the JesusIsSavior.com thing, you know, these guys have a spirit in them, a bewitching spirit, and that's why I tell people, don't listen to Jack Hiles and his little following and stuff like that. They're, they're wicked. And of course, you know, you know, oh, you don't have to repent of sins. Okay, yeah, well, tell us, preach it there, preacher, to us. You know, Jack Hiles, you know, you're up there preaching to us about sin, and you yourself, you're, you know, fornicating with your deacon's wife, Jenny Nishik, you know. And you're up there, you know, you don't have to quit sinning. Well, of course, he's going to say that. He himself is a rotten sinner. He himself is fornicating with his deacon's wife. Of course, he's going to say you don't have to quit sinning. But let's continue. It says here, Myself, I am taking in repentance about stop sinning just in the moment of repentance because I know we can't do that for more than a day, maybe. But maybe they talk about stop sinning for good, not only in the moment of repentance. That's why maybe they say we can't stop sinning. But their sermons are about repentance, so maybe they do talk uh, that we can't stop from sinning ever even in the moment of repentance. Jack actually says, asks, From which sins shall we turn? because we don't know all our sins, and he gives examples of Scripture, cleans, um, me thou, cleanse me thou of secret faults, which David prayed for a proof. To me, faults is not the same as sins, so to me it sounded not a good proof to use that Scripture as an example that we cannot turn from sin. If you want, I can find that sermon which is written on his website and send you. No, thank you. <laughs> so a few days ago, I prayed again to God as I listened to some teachers which seem saved and try to refute lordship salvation and which says that repentance is a change of mind only but after my prayer god gave made me study the scriptures for this and here's what i found from the scriptures which proves what i have experienced at the moment of salvation okay um and of course you know that thing that jack hiles says you know you know about secret faults and things like this you know that you you don't even you can't even realize all the sins you know See, again, it's this Jesuitical mind control tactic. Stephen Anderson uses this all the time. Um, I can prove to you, I can document that some Jews in Israel are not really Jews. They aren't kindredly Jewish. And that's true. That's true. That's very true. There are some people that have just converted to Judaism and they became citizens of Israel and whatever. But see, what I'll do is I'll say, so because I can prove that some Jews are not truly Jewish, then that throws off all Jews. No Jew can truly say that they're truly Jewish. That's a stupid line of reasoning. And see, Jack Hiles is doing the same thing. You can't possibly, you know, repent of all your sins that you've ever committed. So therefore, why repent of any? Um, no, that doesn't work that way. That's, that's stupid. You're coming to God and you're saying, I'm a sinner. And you know out there, you know what your main sins are. You know what you're struggling with. I don't have to tell you. It's between you and God. And you know that there are issues in your life that are making problems between you and the Lord. It might be pride. It might be covetousness. It might be whatever. You know? You know what it is that you have to get cleaned up. But it says here, we're going to look at a bunch of scriptures coming up, but I'm just trying to get through this email here. It says, um, Also, in order for you to know what I believe is that we are saved by repenting, full meaning below, 
Turning to God, asking Him for forgiveness and salvation, we are saved by grace alone and no works whatsoever. We are not kept saved if we do good works. We are sealed forever on salvation. We do good works as a thank you to God, and because this is the way the Holy Spirit makes us feel after salvation, we do works after salvation as a proof to ourselves and the world that we are saved out of gratitude to God. We try to please Him now, if before we couldn't care less of Him. I believe sooner or later it has to show fruits, works meet for repentance, that's what the Bible teaches, proofs of our repentance and our rewards in heaven. It is very strange that I cannot find a good simple teaching in scriptures to back it up for repentance. Yes, we do have to teach the saved about this and that and how to stay strong in true teachings, but our main concern should be for the lost, to make teachings for the lost mainly, to explain repentance, salvation, and of course, what you are doing, misconceptions of hell, angels, what, who God really is, etc. Plus, these teachings might remain left behind for them if Antichrist won't find it and destroy it. Here is what I found from the scriptures. Okay, now we're going to look at some scriptures here. Okay, but just very good points here so far and a lot of good arguments. And this, I mean, this is something that a lot of the brethren are, are fighting over more and more because... You know, the Bible says in Matthew chapter 24, because iniquity shall abound, the love of many shall wax cold. So what do we have in the last days? Do we have a little bit of iniquity or a lot? A whole lot. So there's a lot more area where you can say, yes, but I know uh, somebody and they say that they're a Christian, but they're, you know, watching Hollywood movies, which wouldn't have existed 100 years ago, essentially, you know. Um, and, and they're doing this, and they're doing that, and they're, but I think that they're still saved. See, iniquity abounds. That's why there's such a, a problem with this whole thing. That and also, in most of the free countries, like America especially, you can have, you know, you can be a Christian and it doesn't cost you a thing. Okay? I mean, try out going over to Pakistan or some Islamic country like that and saying, you know, being a Christian isn't going to cost you anything. It's not going to mean a changed life. You know, tell somebody over there that. They'll laugh in your face. They'll say, what are you, what are you talking about? You must be from America. <laughs> but let's first go to Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Here we have the first uh, verse that's listed on the sister's, uh, you know, scriptures list. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. I tell you, nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Uh, she has written here, if you do not repent, you cannot be saved. Okay, now, what is the repentance here in Luke chapter 13? Well, let's get the context. Look up at verse 1. There were present at that season some that told him of the Galileans, whose blood Pilate had mingled with their sacrifices. And Jesus answering said unto them, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans, because they suffered such things? Okay, what happened to them? Pilate sent in basically soldiers, I would assume, and killed them. They're in there doing their sacrifices and stuff, these Jews, you know, and Pilate's like, sends in a bunch of soldiers, just kills them. So they got the animal sacrifice there and the blood's on the floor and things from it and whatever, and now their blood's mingled with that blood of the sacrifice. And Jesus says there, Suppose ye that these Galileans were sinners above all the Galileans because they suffered such things? Verse 3, I tell you nay, but except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. Now what's going on there? Nationally, Israel was suffering. Israel, God was using heathen nations to punish Israel at this time. Why? They had rejected him. They were doing their own thing. You know, they were just, they were getting wicked. They were raising up all these traditions and things of men to overthrow scripture. There was all kinds of trouble back then. So God's just like, go ahead, heathen, go on in there and destroy them, you know, whatever. So what is this talking about here? This, this reference to repent, except ye repent, ye shall all likewise perish. perish. It is talking about a change, okay, a change of mind, a changed direction there, all right? If your nation turns away from God, you know, turn away from God, if they don't turn back to God, except ye repent, Ye shall all likewise perish. That's what Jesus is preaching there. In other words, any nation that turns its back on God is going to suffer pagan armies coming in and destroying people, killing people. 
And it wasn't that those priests were just wicked and things like that, and God singled out those priests alone. No, no. It was that the nation was wicked. And because those priests are part of the nation, they might have been good people and whatever else, but they had to suffer because God's judgment was on the nation of Israel. You know, And America today, except we repent, we are going to likewise perish is what happened to Israel there in the first century. Right now, with all the sodomy and the abortion and all these other horrible things that America is doing, and Hollywood and the biggest pornography producer in the world, all this stuff, government shipping and drugs, and I mean, all these things, all this wicked stuff, if we don't repent, we're going to likewise perish as other great nations have in the past. Okay, so that one is not talking about individual salvation, it is talking about national salvation. Luke chapter 13, verse 3. Okay, you say, well, then, uh, then you're saying, Brian, that you don't have to repent, you know, or you'll be, or you'll perish, you know. You don't, you don't uh, go to hell and, and things if you don't repent. No, that's there too. But in context, that one is talking about a national repentance. So let's go on to the next one. Luke chapter 24, verse 47. Head over to chapter 24 there in the book of Luke. Luke 24, verse 47. Actually, we'll go up to verse 46. And said unto them, Thus it is written, and thus it behooved Christ to suffer and to rise from the dead the third day. Okay, like it says over in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, the gospel is death, burial, resurrection of Jesus Christ. Verse 47, And that repentance and remission of sins should be preached in his name among all nations, beginning at Jerusalem. And ye are witnesses of these things. Okay, so you have repentance and remission of sins. Now, is that national or is that individual? It's individual. That time it's definitely individual. So we see that repentance is tied with remission of sins. Now if repentance, Jack Hiles and his cult out there, they say repentance is turning from unbelief to belief. Okay, what are you believing on? The death, burial, and resurrection of Jesus Christ. Okay, why? Why are you believing those things? Just because you want to go to heaven when you die and you're, you're going to continue in your sin here and just not have anybody tell you about your sins and, and things not be broken, not, not be concerned, you know, and things about that you're a sinner. I'm just going to be, you know, whatever. And just I'm just going to believe and just pray a prayer and I'm going to be in and then I can live my life however I want after that. See, that's a problem. Repentance comes there when, there when there is an understanding that you are a sinner and that you cannot save yourself. Okay, so that repentance leads to remission of sins. Right? And that verse right there, it's not, it's not saying belief and remission of sins. It's repentance and remission of sins. You say, well, then belief, you're saying no belief. No, 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 no. See, because it salvation is it encompasses the thing of understanding that you're a sinner and understanding that those sins are getting you in trouble with God and saying, I don't want to live this way anymore. And coming to God and saying, I'm a sinner. Have mercy upon me as a sinner and change me. And I, I believe that Jesus died on the cross to pay for my sins. Lord, please save me. See, it's all one event, but there are individual parts in that one event, right? You don't just say, I mean, you know, if it's just only belief and there's no repentance, there's no understanding of sin and things like that, understanding why you would be going to hell, if that's not there, then there's a lot of people that are saved that have no desire at all to live for the Lord. I mean, there are hundreds upon hundreds of churches now, you know, these Babel buildings, that are sodomite friendly and openly accepting of sodomy. Sodomite churches. They believe in Jesus as their Savior. And you go, you can check those places out, you can check out their websites, they will tell you the gospel. But they leave out repentance. Wonder why that would be. Next we're going to go to Acts chapter 2, verse 38. 
That's the next one here on this email. Acts chapter 2, verse 38. Okay, it says, Then Peter said unto them, Repent, and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Okay, so there again you see the thing of repentance being tied to the remission of sins. Now, I want to say this about the early part of the book of Acts. Acts is a transition book. Matthew is a trans transition book. Hebrews is a transition book. So you have to be real careful about some of the... <coughs> some of the doctrine that's being taught in it. Okay, Matthew, you're transitioning from Old Testament to New Testament. Okay, coming over there. And the kingdom is offered, is being offered. It's the only book in the entire Bible that says kingdom of heaven. I've talked about that in other studies. <clears throat> so you're transitioning there where Jesus Christ is showing up and he's offering the kingdom. They reject the king. Jesus dies on the cross, buried, raises again from the dead. Now the early part of the book of Acts... You have the kingdom is still being offered to the Jewish people. Okay, they can still accept Jesus Christ as their Messiah. That's why you aren't seeing many Gentiles in the very early part of the book of, of Acts. At the end, the Jews are dealing almost exclusively with Gentile believers, you know, and and the Jews are just hunting them down wherever they go. You know. So there's a transition in the book of Acts. The transition in the book of Acts is the gospel was first taken to the Jews as a nation. They, you know, the gospel of that Jesus Christ just fulfilled with his death on the cross. And that gospel is going to the Jewish people and they reject again nationally. So now it goes over to the Gentiles until the time of Jacob's trouble, you see. Hebrews, the book of Hebrews, you're going from the church age, which we're now in, into the time of the Jacob's into the time of Jacob's trouble. All right, so again, it's another transition book. So people can get really messed up in the book of Matthews, or Matthew, excuse me, book of Matthew, the book of Acts, the book of Hebrews. You can get really messed up in those three books. And this is another one right here. You cannot base salvation today off of Acts chapter 2, verse 38. All right, very important there. Repentance and baptism is not going to save you. Okay, it's faith. All right, that's the, that's the uh, mode of salvation right now. Faith, not baptism. All right, that's another one that's very important to get. But again, though, you see the thing of repent for the remission of sins. Now, next go to Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Acts chapter 3, verse 19. Okay. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out when the times of refreshing shall come from the presence of the Lord. All right. Repent ye therefore and be converted that your sins may be blotted out. So again, we see this thing of conversion and sins being blotted out, sins, you know, the remission of sins. You see it being tied to repentance. And again, you know, you go back into the book of Acts and it's like, were these people having a changed life? Was there a change that happened after their salvation? Yes, obviously. You know, Stephen. Did Stephen's life change after he got saved? Acts chapter 7? Yes. How about Saul? His name changed to Paul. Acts chapter 9. I saw recently in one of my SAA, you know, Stephen Anderson in his lives videos, I said Acts chapter 8 for, for Paul. No, it was Acts chapter 9. <laughs> Messed up there. But, Life will change when you get saved. And it's not about you as a person changing things and doing all kinds of stuff to merit your salvation. No, 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 no. You know, it's about the Lord coming upon you and His Holy Spirit indwelling you and saying, okay, do this, don't do that, you know, whatever else, like that. Your relationship to God changes. Okay, next go to Acts chapter 11, verse 18. Acts chapter 11, verse 18. When they heard these things, they held their peace and glorified God, saying, Then hath God also to the Gentiles granted repentance unto life. Okay? What's going on there? The Jews are hearing Gentiles speaking in other tongues. Okay? And so they go, 
wow, God's also given repentance, you know, there. What does it say? Grant repentance unto life. So, you know, again, if repentance is just merely belief, uh, how's that work out? God has granted belief. Um, okay, so then you're teaching Calvinism? That these Gentiles were predetermined, pre-elected, you know, people? No, no, that's not what's going on there. God, you know, here's another thing, which I don't always make real clear. I mean, there's a lot of my studies, I mean, people really nitpick things and stuff like that, and they go in and they look and they, they take this and they take that and whatever else, and that's fine. You know, I encourage you to do that. Check what I'm saying according to the Scriptures. But a lot of times I, I kind of leave out the thing that it's God that's doing the work. I just assume people understand that, you know, and sometimes I'm wrong in making those assumptions. God is the one that will make the changes in your life, and God is the one who saves you, right? Okay, you say, what's well, my faith? Well, if you come to the Lord and you aren't meeting His standards for salvation, you don't come, you come in your pride, you come mockingly and say, you know, I've, I've had atheists do that with me. They'll go, I believe that Jesus died for my sins and I just want to be saved and I prayed in Jesus' name, amen. Ha, 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 ha. They'll do that. Now see, if you're an easy believism person, that atheist just called upon the name of the Lord to be saved. See? see no, but it doesn't work that way, obviously. You know, I mean, you'd have to be rather stupid to think that that atheist is saved now because he, you know, said that he believes in Jesus. Obviously, he doesn't. He's just being sarcastic, you know. But you have somebody that says, I want to use this Christian religion uh, for my profit. I forget one of the popes, uh, early on, one of the popes, you know, like, I forget what it was like around, I forget what, 700, 800 AD, something, I forget. I should have that written. I don't, it's not part of the study or whatever, but one of the popes said how profitable the fable of Christ has been to us. It's in the, the movie, um, The Forbidden Book. They quote that, how profitable the fable of Christ has been to us. Now, if you had talked to that guy, if you'd hear him preach or do his official declarations, I'm sure he said that he was a Christian, that he believed in Jesus. But he was using Jesus to make money, just like Jack Hiles did. And a lot of these other guys, you know, ministers of Satan, so, again, what is the repentance there? Um, you know, that, that God grants repentance to somebody. That is, they come to God and God looks and He looks at their heart and He says, Okay, you know, I see that you've come to me in the right condition. You're a sinner. You can't save yourself. Therefore, you came in the right spirit. You came with a broken, contrite spirit. I'm going to save you. You're not here, you know, like the old hymn, Rock of Ages, you know. In my hand, no price I bring, simply to thy cross I cling. You know, I don't bring any, there's no self-righteousness. I can't merit my salvation here in any possible way. I simply just have to fall at the mercy of, of God and just say, God, be merciful to me, a sinner. See? Repenting of your pride, turning from that pride... But let's continue. Uh, says here, it is commanded of God for us to repent. It is not an option. Acts chapter 17, verse 30. So go to Acts chapter 17, verse 30. Acts 17, verse 30 says, In the times of this ignorance God winked at, but now commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Okay. What's going on there is in the Old Testament you had... God was dealing with one nation, the nation of Israel. Now, you could come in and you could be converted into that nation and, and become, you know, into that religion, I should say, and become a citizen of Israel there. Um, you could do that. But most of the other nations were just heathen, and God wasn't dealing with them. And so the times of that ignorance, God winked at. He was just like, well, you know, whatever there, you know, there's other people. But now... He commandeth all men everywhere to repent. Oh, excuse me. So, all men now 
can understand their need for salvation. And all men can turn from their wicked lifestyle that's got them in trouble with the Lord. All men everywhere have that ability to feel uh, bad for what they're doing. They might not understand why. I know my wife often talks about that. She often says that back before she got saved, she would tell people, I don't want to do that. That's wrong. And they'd say, what do you mean it's wrong? And she'd say, I don't know. I just feel it's wrong. They'd say, well, what's your proof? I don't know. I just, I feel that this is wrong. I don't want to do this. You know? See? You have a conscience. And now God is dealing with you differently. God's not dealing with just the nation of Israel anymore. He is now also dealing with all men everywhere. So, got to keep that in mind too. Um, next it says here, uh, feeling sorry for the wicked sins. If uh, before was not a big deal, now you realize it is uh, for God, just a feeling, not a work. A uh, number, and then over here it says, stop the sin. Is that a work? A and B together are feel sorry and stop. What is work? When you start doing work, something, or even when you stop doing something. If I do not have a job, work means I do a work. If I do not eat, means I do a work. Um, and then she gives the definitions here for work in Webster's uh, Dictionary. I'll just read a couple of these. It says, in a general sense, to move or to move one way and the other, to perform as in popular language, it is said a mill or machine works well. Okay, um, So something working is like a machine. <coughs> right now that camera that's uh, videotaping me, it's digital. So however it's recording inside, there's not a little tape going around or anything, but it's working. I know it's working because I can see the little red light that says record. Uh, number two, it says here, the second definition for work, to labor, to be occupied in performing manual labor, whether s severe or moderate, one man works better than another, one man works uh, here, another works uh, lazily. Hair, okay, I don't quite get that one. Um, to be in action or motion as the working of the heart, to act, to carry on operations, our better part remains to work in close design, to operate, to carry on business, and, you know, the others are pretty much the same thing there. So the, the, the whole point is work is an active thing that you have to keep doing. Okay, now that's not, you know, work salvation would be the Catholics, they practice it, you know, where you have to go to Mass continually. Uh, eating the Eucharist, you know, once you eat Jesus Christ in the form of the wafer and the wine, drinking His blood eating flesh, drinking blood, that only lasts for about 15 to 20 minutes. You know, and then Jesus leaves you, you know, via the toilet. And uh, that's what they believe. And, uh, you know, so salvation for a Catholic is a continuing process. You're never done with salvation. You have to continually save yourself. And those people that don't believe in eternal security... You know, which I do, I've defended it, you know, I do believe in eternal security. And those people that do not believe in eternal security, they are keeping themselves saved. Um, I'm going to be bringing out some stuff in the future about the Amish cult. Uh, I'm, I'm actually uh, been talking to some Amish in the area here and uh, finding out some pretty interesting things. My wife and I are doing a lot of study into this whole thing, so it's, it's very interesting what we're finding. But most of them do not believe in eternal security. And they are working. That's why they live without the electric. That's why they uh, live in peculiar ways and dress peculiar ways, whatever. They are trying to merit their salvation. Just like a, a monk at a monastery or a nun in a convent. That's what they're doing. See, that's work salvation. Somebody that comes and says, you know, I'm going to live a different life after I get saved of trying to clean up my life and trying to, you know, I'll obey the Lord and the Lord will give me a changed life. That's not work salvation, okay? Because you're not excluding faith in Jesus Christ as the means of salvation. That's there. And then what you do afterwards is about sanctification, staying right with the Lord, staying away from sin so you don't mess up your life. That's not work salvation, okay? And this sister is not teaching work salvation by what she's written here. But next we're going to go to Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 6. This 
There's a lot of good verses here that, that she's brought up. And um, we're going to look at the, these verses in the study here. Jeremiah chapter 8, verse 6. I hearkened and heard, but they spake not aright. No man repented him of his wickedness, saying, What have I done? Everyone turned to his course as the horse rusheth into the battle. Okay. No man turned him. Look what it says there. No man repented, excuse me, no man repented him of his wickedness. Okay. Now, what does that mean? You say, turning from unbelief to belief. Please, come on. First of all, Jesus Christ hadn't even died on the cross yet at this point in time. We're back in the Old Testament. But secondly, look at that. Repented him of his wickedness. See, it is something where you are turning from living that life of wickedness. You know, and you say, well, then you'll never sin again. No, 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 that's not the argument here. The argument here is not turning and becoming sinlessly perfect in and of your own works, in your own system there. It's simply saying your attitude, your mindset changes to that life of sin that you once lived. And now by God's power, when God saves you and His Holy Spirit comes upon you, now you have the ability to turn from that sinful life of your past and to have a new life in Christ Jesus. Do you understand that? A lot of people don't seem to get that. And they're defending all kinds of people out there that simply say that they're saved, and yet things aren't quite lining up. Next, go to Job chapter 42. Job 42. Okay, wherefore I abhor myself and repent in dust and ashes. Okay, so what do we have tied in with repent there? Abhorring yourself. You know, it's like I heard the one time repentance, a good definition for repentance is not being sorry for what you've done. It's being sorry for what you are. God have mercy on me, a sinner. See? I mean, you can get caught doing some kind of a sin, and you can cry your crocodile tears and, oh, I'm so sorry, I'll never do it again. Oh, I can't believe it was bad. It was a terrible thing. <laughs> you know, a week later, you're back doing it again. But see, it's a different philosophy when you come to the Lord and you say, I'm not only sorry for what I've done, I'm sorry for who I am, for what I am. I'm just, I, I'm useless before you, God. And the, the, the thought of trying to earn my way into heaven by good works is so preposterous, I'm not even going to try. I can't be good enough to get into heaven. God, if, if, if I mean, I, I believe Jesus died for my sins. If there's any way you could save me, please save me, because I can't save myself. That's the repentance that leads to salvation. Okay? 2 Corinthians chapter 7, verses 9 and 10 